I'd like to call the meeting of the Planning Commission, the August 15th meeting of the Planning Commission to order. Can I have the roll call, please? Rodriguez. Present. Newton. Here. Green. Fragoso. Here. Kierlein. Here. Gonzalez Parber. Here. Chair Swift. Here. Next item is approval of the agenda. Does anyone want to make any changes or make a motion to approve the agenda? If there are no recommended changes, I move approval of our agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, I'm going to read the meeting protocol. The chair shall maintain order at the meetings in accordance with Robert's rules of order, and the commission has a responsibility to be a model of respectful behavior in order to encourage community participation and citizen input at commission meetings. The commission and the audience are expected to refrain from using profane language and or ridiculing the character or motive of commission members, staff, or members of the public, and to maintain the standards of tolerance and civility. Um, we're now going to have public comments on non-agenda items. Anyone wishing to address the commission on matters not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the commission may do so now. Please state the matter on which you wish to speak. Matters not appearing on the, plan, on the commission's agenda will not receive action at this meeting, but may be referred to staff for a future meeting. Presentations will be limited to three minutes or as otherwise established by the commission chair. Persons are not required to give their name or address, but it is helpful for speakers to state their name for the record and whether or not they are a Fairfax resident in order that the secretary may identify them. Do I have anyone wishing to speak during public open time? Good evening, Rick Kamer, um, Fairfax. Um, I just want to, um, so to speak, put the bug in the Planning Commission's ear about sustainability in Fairfax, that among the th items in order to uh, produce a truly sustainable community requires that some of our local community must be dedicated to the infrastructure to make it truly sustainable, which includes some of the um, infrastructure and other items, which when I looked at the zoning map, uh, I did not see any uh, um, flexibility in zoning to allow some of these facilities, which may not be environmentally dirty, but ultimately contribute to our environmental sustainability. And you'll be hearing more about this future in the future. However, I'm just, like I said, I'm just bringing out the introduction of, of some items that may be proposed in the future to help Fairfax truly be a, uh, a, uh, uh, a model of a small, sustainable community. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have anyone else wishing to speak during public open time? If not, I'm going to close public comments. And go. Uh, there's nothing on the consent calendar, so we're going to go to our first item, 80 Crest Road. Uh, the owners will be out of the country for both the months of August and Septem September, and so they've requested a continuance until the October meeting. They signed uh, the town's agreement for a mutual extension of time in compliance with the Permit Streamlining Act, and we are recommending that you grant their requested continuance to October 17, 2019. Is there any public comments on this item? Seeing none, bringing it back to the commission. Any discussion or a motion? I'll move to continue the item. 
uh, per staff's recommendation. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any no. opposed? Any opposed? No. And I'm opposing it because it was unpermitted improvements that we're trying to bring them forward on and we shouldn't continue to give them continuances. We should push forward. I have compassion for them being out of town, but uh, I'm more speaking to the point of unpermitted work needing to get permitted. Thank you. Motion carries. Go on to our second item. 102 Marinda Drive, application 1913. Ready? Okay. The Ross Valley Charter School is requesting an exception to the sign ordinance to place a new 24 square foot sign in the same location as the previously approved St. Rita's School sign. The sign colors would be, blue, would be a blue background with white lettering for the Ross Valley Charter School name and yellow lettering below that for the school grades reading a TK through five public school. The town code lists freestanding so signs as one of the type of signs that's prohibited unless the planning commission grants an exception to the sign ordinance regulations. The school site is located east of Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, north of the small commercial strip mall, uh, 2082 through 2094 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, 2096 Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, which is the Fitzpatrick Heating and Cooling Building, the vacant parcel north of the Fairfax Market and the northeastern corner of the Fairfax Market property. Because of the location of the school building set approximately 150 feet east of Sir Francis Drake Boulevard's corridor, behind buildings, parking lots, and the unexcavated hill, there is no other place to really locate a sign to provide school identification except next to the driveway to the school parking area between St. Rita's Church and St. Rita's Community Center. Signs have existed in the proposed location since 2001 without creating any complaints, visibility issues for pedestrians or vehicles entering or entering the site or passers-by on foot. No illumination is proposed by the sign. We did, um, so we are recommending that you approve the project. We did want you to, to um, have a bit of a discussion about the, the school logo, which staff really likes. And we think it would just add a lot to the sign if they had the logo somewhere on it, maybe at the top. And so we just were wondering what your thoughts were and if you thought that that would really add to the sign, the appearance of the sign, you could add that as a condition that the logo be, be included somewhere in the sign design. And that would conclude our report. Thank you. Um, does the commission have any questions of staff? I, I have a question for staff. I'm sorry, can you clarify? What logo they're requesting? They, they aren't proposing a logo, but if you look at the very, they included their color palette for you. So if you look at the very last page very of your staff page. report, at the top right, they have these nice little trees that are oh, in I blue. And, <laughs> and, and, and where would that go? I think it could, go, you know, it could go anywhere. It could go right at the top, though. Thank you, for you know, they have the logo on their banner right now. When you drive down Sir Francis Drake Boulevard, it's at the top of the banner, and it just looks, staff, staff, this staff member feels it looks nice. Um, you want to hear from them why they didn't propose to include it. Yeah. I see you uh, dropped off a letter from, or an email, sorry, from Lynn Yetter. And at the bottom, it looks like it's cut off, and I don't see the whole thing. The one you emailed us, and so you, you copied us because uh, she sent a reply. Yeah, so here's your here's your Okay, and I, I guess I understood from what I was reading here that her concern primarily, does anybody else want to look at this? Uh, her concern primarily was the, um, I'd love to look at it too, was the size, and um, I didn't have a chance to compare this to the 
originally approved one. And it's one. the same size, but I think there's I think there's either misinformation out there. For some reason, people thought it was going to be 24 feet wide, but it's 24 square feet in size. It's going to fit exactly where the charter, the um, Cascade Canyon and the St. Rita sign went. And then she also felt that the colors should be the, you know, what the St. Rita's sign colors were to blend in with the, with the church buildings, but I, staff doesn't agree with her. I think it's better for the charter school to be able to have, use its own colors for its sign and, you know, draw and direct people to where they're located. Okay, another question I have is um, in both the staff report and the resolution, uh, we are referencing 170640060G. No, but I think it's a, a. I think the interpretation is not accurate. So, what we have here, and I'm looking specifically at the resolution because that was. Uh, yeah, the whereas clause there, it says that uh, the applicant has met the burden of proof required to support the following finding. And the way I read the um, requirement uh, under 17064-100, uh, the Planning Commission may grant an exception if it finds that the exception is not inconsistent with the purpose and intent of this chapter. And that finding is not reflected here. And then it goes on to say, and that the strict adherence to the regulation may cause unnecessary hardship if one of the following exists. So the way I read that, and then it goes on with the list um, one, two, three, and four uh, about the findings and the includes the um, exceptional or extraordinary circumstances or conditions finding. But the way I read B is we have to make two findings. We have to make the finding that it's not inconsistent with the purpose and intent of the chapter. And that involves going back to 17064.10 which has listed A through G as the purpose and intent of the chapter. So I think we can resolve this, but I think after we hear public comment, I'm gonna probably read all that out because even though I don't wanna write all that into the resolution, I would recommend making findings plural if we're gonna approve this and adding the uh, first part of the language from 100B about the exception not being inconsistent with the purpose and intent of the chapter. That's fine. Any other, Michelle? I had a question about how St. Rita's or how the previous, what was the findings that they previously were granted the approval for? Or are we saying this is independent by itself? Because the staff report seems to hang its hat on previous approvals, yet the finding seems to be more based upon well, we uh, we location. We weren't trying to hang our hat okay. on previous approvals. We were just giving you the history. Okay. But I think they used, so when we've been approving sign ordinances, we've always just cited one finding. And so they used the same one, that the school is in the back and mm -hmm. nobody can see it. Mm -hmm. So without a sign out at the street, I mean, it seems like the parents would eventually figure out where the school was, but they have back to school nights and fundraisers and people coming that don't know where the school is, right? So you have to somehow, but I have the file here, I can verify that, but I'm pretty sure that's what it was granted. So when you look on. at the sign ordinance regarding freestanding signs, um, so all freestanding signs have to get an exception? They're supposed to. And so is there any standards in the sign ordinance regarding signs, uh, freestanding signs at all? You mean like how big they can be? Yes, no. and whether it's based upon frontage mm -hmm. or building, there is no standards. Nope. So it's whatever the public, oh, that's a good mm -hmm. one. 
think about updating in the future. Okay. Um, and then what was the other question I had? I forgot. Oh, I know. I know. Do we have a view triangle standard in the city, like a public works or driveway uh, view triangle? I'm pretty sure that there is one. Uh, it's kind of built into the public works terminology, so, and I don't believe this sign creates a problem with that because it's, of course, behind a fairly wide sidewalk area. Well, we ran it by the public works department. They didn't comment. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'll speak to that later. Thank you. Any other questions of staff from the commission? I, I have a question. Um, so we are looking at this for the size only or the, des the design? I'm, like I'm looking at the fonts and the color and I think that's, I understand we're looking at it for that as well. And the location and the size yeah. and the height above ground. Yeah. yeah, okay. Any other questions? Uh, how how uh, specific do you think we could we should be or could be about uh, the logo if we were to recommend or require it? I don't know. Oh, you mean like where it would be located and I, you could be specific or you could leave it up to them to just incorporate it where they thought it looked the best? My recommendation would be to turn that back over to them and their graphic designer just in the interest of maximizing the aesthetic value. They, who knows, maybe they've come in with a back pocket design insofar as they're aware that staff is looking for some visual upgrades if possible. Through, through the chair, attachment B shows a specific location where it is to be placed. So, oh no, actually it's not placed where the existing sign was, but in a new location. Uh, attachment B, is the existing sign the original St. Rita sign? And then the proposed new location up at the corner is a new location? I thought it was going in the same location. It's going That's in the not same location. It says on attachment B. Well, if you look at so turn turn attachment B so that the church is on your left and the church hall is on your right. It's going in the planner right to the north of the exit to St. Rita's Church. So that's where the that's where the old St. Rita's Church sign was and that's where they're proposing to put it. It's I'm in the sorry, same what location. What is the existing sign on this attachment B? That's a little mock-up that they did. The color elevation? No. That's where it has handwritten proposed... So is, is that a different sign? Um, I would, yes, Norma. I believe yeah. that's the sign for the church. The church has their own sign that says, like, what time they have services. Okay. And that's, oh, that, yes, that, that is I, the church it's, it's sign. It's kind of a small a kind of, sign. like, um, yeah. yeah. There, so there, there are two separate signs. But the proposed location is where the old sign is. Yes was before. Right. Thank you. And that's where Cascade Canyon right. had their sign before in the same location. Right. Any other questions to staff? If not, would the applicant like to come and speak? Thanks. Luke Duchesne, Fairfax, and School Director Ross L.A. Charter. Um, thank you for considering uh, this sign. Um, yeah, ba basically, we're planning on doing using the same posts that the St. Rita sign was on and the Cascade Canyon sign was on. We've removed both of those, and so we would just be putting our sign up on the same posts in the same location of the same size. Uh, regarding design, we had had our logo as part of the sign, but it, we felt it was looking too cluttered and kind of too distracting. So we just 
we ended up going towards just having the clear words of our school name on the sign. At some point we had a, a faded version of this as kind of like a, a water, <laughs> you know, watermark in the back, but then we thought that that just might be, you know, might not, people might not even tell that it's there, so. We were just trying to have a, a clean, simple sign. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Michelle? Um, thank you. So regarding um, all the users in the building, is it you and the church? And, and you've, you're occupying 100% of the space, so we can't anticipate in the future a third, a fourth, a fifth user is going to come and everybody's going to want their signs out there? There is a preschool that is, that is occupying a small part of the space that is separate from us. And then... Um, I saw on your mock-up, or maybe it was the photo, that you had a special event flyer below it. It said Camp Thunder Blast. Yeah, so is that, that, that is, there is, that's been a camp that's been operating out of that site for many years called Camp Thunder Blast, and they've, had, they've hung their banner on those posts for about three years. I think my question was for your school, if your sign is approved right. for your special events, is that where you intend to put banners? Um, if, if, if that's in accordance with okay. uh, sign ordinance and for the time Okay, of thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Yes, I have a question. The font for Ross Valley, is that specific to your logo or is that something that you chose for, you know, visibility? Uh, that's a font that's specific to our logo. Okay. We're trying to be consistent in all of our signs and images. Any other questions for the applicant? No, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up now to public comments on this item. Yeah, hi, I'm a Fairfax resident. Um, and my issue with the sign, I think, of course, they need a sign if they're located there for wayfinding. So it if, should have. I'm sorry. If you're comfortable with it? Can you provide your name? You don't have to. Sarah. Um, so I think the point of the sign is for wayfinding because the school is located in the back. So of course they should have a sign for that, their name, and maybe their logo, maybe not. But beyond that, I don't think you should give them the variance for a bigger sign. You know, they have their marketing message underneath a TK to five public school. That's kind of part of their positioning and marketing. So I don't think it's fair to have that on the sign, to have a bigger sign to allow that text, because that has nothing to do with wayfinding. That borders on advertising. Um, and to, I can't remember your name at the end, but to your, that Camp Thunderblast, um, they are going to have a preschool there, so it's possible that soon they're going to come here and say, oh yeah, we need a sign too, because they're going to be a third tenant at that location. And the last thing is the sign, the, Saint, the original St. Rita School sign was the same sign that this school's proposing, but the Cascade Canyon sign, I believe, and Miss Neal can correct me, was as wide, but not as tall. It was about half as tall and it just had their name. So again, my point is just for wayfinding, of course, but like we're, it's kind of a slippery slope if you start allowing people to have more marketing slash advertising positioning language. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Lyons. I live in Fairfax and I'm also a teacher at Ross Valley Charter School. And I wanted to address a couple of things. One is um, the TK to five public school is part of our logo. It's on all of our stuff. It's not a marketing tool. It's a it's part of the logo, so that people know, you know, what are the grade levels of our school. Um, that's one thing. The other is Camp Thunderblast, 
is the same uh, operator as Kinder Blast, I believe it's called, which is going to be the new preschool. So they've basically just applied to become a preschool as well as an after-school program and a summer camp and a, a camp for when there's uh, weeks of no school. So it's the same organization. And they have said that if they would decide to have a, a sign for their um, preschool program, that they would have it in the same spot where their sign is right now. It's basically just a banner that hangs below where our sign would be. And our sign is going to be the exact same size as the other school signs that have been there before. So I think that's all I was going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sharon Sager from Fairfax. I'm uh, the board chair of the Ross Valley Charter School. Thank you for hearing our um, request this evening. I do want to just correct a little bit of information. The Cascade Canyon sign was actually as big, if not bigger, than the St. Rita sign because when we took the Cascade Canyon sign off, we were surprised that the St. Rita sign was still there. Um, so we're not proposing to move the poles or anything, and we're proposing to make our sign the same size as the St. Rita sign was. Um, and again, it would be silly for schools to have signs that just say they're a school and not uh, say what kind of a school they are. We have signs around our community that say elementary school, middle school, and so on. So it's very specific to let people know what kind of a school it is and what ages the students would be at that school. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? If not, I'm going to close public comment and bring it back to the commission for deliberations. Any comments? Thoughts? I, I'd like to say, have a few comments. Um, I would just say that the materials that were shown, that were given to us by Linda, my, da my daughter went to St. Rita's in, the, in 2001, so I know at the time their sign was different. It was like white and blue. They had a different logo and then, I don't know, six, some, some time during the course when she went to school there, they, did, they changed it to this logo. So I kind of think that this sign, my recollection is similar to the one that was originally approved back in 2001. Um, and I would agree that I think there's a way that we could subtly add the logo because I think it looks kind of a little too plain and would improve the design. Um, I do have a concern about the banner and adding banners and especially if there is going to be another use that you would have to go through. If they are going to add another sign that that would have to go through the approval without applicant. Banner signs like that are on the freestanding sign. They're supposed to get approved by you. So that sign that's out there now is not permitted. Right. So that's yeah. what I'm trying right. to say is that right. we, I would like to, if it's not already in the, um, in the resolution, there should, we should add, add it. Some, some type of um, statement that any other signs, banners, or anything that's not shown on this exhibit would need to come for approval. Any other attachment or? <clears throat> Any other comments? I, I have one question, Linda. Um, on attachment C, the large sketch of the sign, the blue is one color, and on the fold out page, it's the sign elevation. The color is quite different. And I'm wondering, which will it be? Because I think you need to ask the applicant because um, one, one I only received one copy of. So the large one that has the logo on it, I only received one copy and I had to copy it on the copy machine. The, the, um, the one that's a bright, uh, like a brighter blue, I was able to print directly from an email that was sent to me. So I believe that this is the accurate one, right? This is the... Yeah. So that's the blue. That's, that's good, because I was concerned with the lighter blue that you wouldn't be able to see charter uh, on that particular shade of blue. The other one should be fine. Uh, 
I, so I, oh, go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say I agree that the tree logo um, would enhance the sign. Um, however, when you put that logo on top of that blue, it's gonna disappear. And when I first looked at this, um, and you know, I, I'm not sure if, if all your um, marketing materials are this dark or if you have variations. Um, I, Cause I, th I think the blue, in my opinion, is a little bit too bold. It's not working uh, for wayfinding, in my opinion. And I, you know, I kind of see that you're, you know, the, the graphic design, the, the Ross Valley is kind of compensating for that. And so I think, you know, sometimes you just have to play with the colors a little bit to see, you know, sometimes black works better on light blue and all that. So, I mean, I was comparing Ross Valley to St. Rita, you know, St. Rita's, and this is two words, and what's the other one? St. Rita's school is three words, and so I don't know, I'm having a little bit of a problem with the proportions and the color. I think this can be refined a little bit more. Um, I, I agree that the bottom, the A, uh, TK through five public school, I think I would crash if I had to try to read this. You know, it's, I think it's a distraction. I don't think a logo needs to describe what the services are or what the function are. I think a logo is more easily identifiable with a symbol, just like when you go to the emergency department, it says emergency. It doesn't say, you know, who it is and what it is. It's just everybody can identify it. It's, it's a quick at a glance um, understanding and color is very important, but I think that the darkness with this font in particular, and I understand it's your font, but I, I, I don't think it's there yet in terms of wayfinding, if that's the purpose. Um, I don't have a problem with the size or the location. Um, I, think, I think the little tree is, is lovely. I think you, if I saw that, I'd, I'd know, okay, yeah, it's kind of blue. There's the tree, there it is. So I just, I think there's kind of too much going on here, but not enough to serve the purpose. So I, I, I would like to see a little bit more in terms of color balance with font. Uh, and I don't know, uh, it's because I know these signs are expensive to, to make, so. Any other comments, Mimi? Michelle. Okay. Um, I kind of think that we should have a master sign program. I think we should have some information from the church that talks about the ultimate users in this space and what, what all of those would look like. Because I feel like we're kind of getting a patchwork that it might be Ross Valley and then Thunder Blast, Kinder Blast, pre uh, preschool. I don't know what on that, but usually there's a master sign program that articulates how uniformly they're all going to look, where they're gonna be located and so on. Um, I, I feel like the sign is too big and I think that the photo that the woman sent us in the communication with the email, I think is proof about that it's just too big for this building and this site. This is not a high speed freeway that you need something this this large. I understand they wanna put it on the the two stands, but it feels too large to me. I also, when I went out there, um, comparing it to attachment B, in actuality, the sidewalk ends right where the planter is in front of this sign. And so where it says, you know, where the, where the property kind of goes down here, this is all sidewalk. And that sign, is actually rotated slightly. And so my visibility to anybody on the sidewalk and the road was obscured. But that's only because the bottom of the sign, if it was placed at three feet, I think would be fine. So the, it, I think it has to be at least three feet above there so that when you're in a car, you can see 
go, going in either direction. So I don't know how that relates to future banners and stuff that they want to do. Um, I agree that I'd like to see a little bit more work on this. I, I don't think the public school is part of it. I like the tree idea. The font type in the Ross Valley, I agree, could, um, it's this, the proportion is off. And the materials for this sign are not articulated, so I don't really know what this is gonna be constructed of. Um, and I'm also a little concerned that I don't know what findings we're, we're doing. It was the earlier reference to what section of the code and so on, so we'll see where we get with that. Thank you. So I um, agree with some of the things that have been said, uh, maybe not all of them. Uh, I don't have a specific problem with the TK to five public school. Um, I guess previously we approved signs with a motto. So, you know, to me it's not much different. We have signage for commercial, so even if it is somewhat of an advertisement. I, I'm not sure I have a concern with that. Um, I like the logo, but I guess I have uh, concerns with, I guess I have concerns with the whole concept of second guessing the designer. So um, I, I, I'll throw out my thoughts. I really like the logo. Uh, I don't have concerns with the proportions and color. Uh, I agree with the comments about the font and uh, that it's not the best font. And I also think that if there are other tenants, there needs to be other tenants who would be, you know, uh, identified on this sign as Commissioner Rodriguez mentioned for uh, the future that there should be some accommodation on the sign itself. I prefer that to a banner. If there's some place where a future tenant could put their name and logo, for example. And if that meant redesigning the sign such that the logo wasn't uh, practical or uh, optimal, I think that would be best. In terms of the findings, um, the, the regulation, again, basically the first finding that I would propose for the resolution would say uh, under the first or the second whereas clause, I'd mark it as A, I guess. The exception is not inconsistent with the purpose and intent of the Fairfax Town Code Chapter 17064 signs. And then I'd add an and and put a B next to the next paragraph that says the location of the school set back from the street and not visible from Sir Francis Drake Boulevard is the exceptional circumstance, blah, blah, blah. Now, when we look at 170.64.10, the purpose and intent of the chapter, as I said before, A through G are listed, and I'll just read them. Protect the public health, safety, and general welfare of the town by ensuring that the number, type, size, and design of all signs will be compatible with the town's unique character. That's A. B safeguard and enhance property values, C, protect and enhance the town's natural setting and small scale residential character, D, protect the high quality of architectural design of the newer buildings and preserve the character of the older buildings, E, improve the appearance of the town as a place to live and to work and as an attraction to non-residents who come to visit or to trade, F, encourage sound signing practices as an aid to business and for the information of the public. And G, encourage creative designs and a high quality sign program throughout the town through implementation of the design review criteria and standards in this title. I had a question for staff. 
So if there's another tenant there that comes in and wants to put a sign to identify their preschool or whatever their business is, and we've got that sign there, we've got the church sign on the other side, how would town address that in that area? If it's a freestanding sign, it requires a permit from you. And it would be noticed and you, there would be a public hearing. So if they, if they propose it in a location that doesn't seem acceptable to the planning commission, it could be denied. You could require that it be moved. They are allowed to have one, you know, businesses are allowed to have signs on their building, one flat on the building and one projecting. So, you know, if a business proposed a sign that complied with the sign ordinance, it would be reviewed and approved by staff. But anything that doesn't meet the code requires an exception from you after a public hearing. It may be useful to ask the applicants whether to their knowledge, they sort of alluded to it in the presentation about the, these temporary banners. Um, and if so, um, even though it's not part of this proposal, uh, your commission could provide direction on whether the use of temporary banners might be acceptable for those additional businesses, i.e. hanging below it. Um, if there's an understanding that this is a temporary thing, um, it does sort of get into the cohesiveness of the overall sign program. Certainly, if you're gonna end up with a business with a permanent sign, you'd want to take a look at that in relation to other signage. But if we're talking most likely about a continuation of the temporary camp, whatever it was, thunder blast, uh, on, a, on a banner um, hanging below the sign, your commission is familiar with the proposed location and dimensions. If you're comfortable providing direction on whether or not you would consider that acceptable, um, it'd just be useful to move that discussion along. If your commission doesn't feel like they have enough information to opine on that, we could ask the applicant to incorporate that possibility or current practice into their program, into their signed program. Okay, I'm not, to that point, I'm not comfortable with, with that. Um, I like uh, Laura's approach of requiring in a resolution, should we get there, of noting that anything else or any other business that has an idea of putting signage on that same structure would need to come in for approval. So um, from my perspective, I'm okay with the, the sign where it is and, and the size. Um, I don't know how the tree graphic would look on there. I think it would add to the signage, um, but I could go either way on that um, with, uh, with the rest of the commission but I'm okay with the sign as it's proposed in that location and that size and with the, you know, with the colors and with um, the TK piece on the bottom of it. Through the chair. I don't have a problem with the sign size. It's the existing size, however, uh, this photograph has one apparent location for where it goes and then the other diagram attachment B shows uh, a different more of a angled corner location whereas this is flat out against the edge and I'm not clear which which way it will be placed actually um, do you have an answer for that? It, it, it's angled so that um, drivers... It's angled so that drivers who are coming out can see to the right and to the left. So it is angled as indicated in attachment B yes. at the corner. Okay, thank you. Thank 
Thank you. I have some concern about the size of these letters and the colors still. Uh, if you look at the St. Rita sign, it's the same size and it has as many letters, but they write St. Rita School all on one line and it gives you space for the logo. Uh, I think that these letters are, uh, are quite huge. If this is a four foot sign, that letter band of Ross Valley is about two feet long, seven feet wide, whereas the St. Rita School was uh, not, not such a large letter. I think it's the proportions of the sign that I have problems with. And I honestly don't think you're gonna be able to read Charter. Um, but, um, so those are my concerns. I also, I wouldn't mind the logo, but the way you have it now, I think it would look a little clunky sticking it in there. Uh, there's not enough space. The way you've laid out the circular lettering. So I'm going to poll um, the commission as far as do we think we have enough um, consensus on this to vote on it and approve it tonight? Or is there some sense of what you would like the applicant to come back with should they choose to, to do that? I would like to see them come back. Specifically with what? Specifically with the tree logo and, um, you know, I, I'm, I keep thinking about the purpose of the sign, which is wayfinding, and I just think the Ross Valley can be better. Uh, I, it's, it's not so much the color, but it's just the way the, two, the color and the Ross Valley is working. When I look at it um, against the other sign, Somehow, I think there's a way to make Ross Valley more visible, e even if it's smaller. And I mean, I, I guess I don't really take exception so much to the TK, but it's just pr as far as how do you make this read a little bit better for wayfinding? I, you know, I think it's up to the designer, but I th just think that it's Ross Valley is too big uh, to work the way I think it needs to work but it could pop out a little bit more. And the tree, I'd like the tree in. May I piggyback on Commissioner Gonzalez's comments? I have submitted and have seen many sign requests in my days, and my preference would be to have a scaled model of your sign. How big are these letters? How wide are they? I would like to see a dimensioned sketch along these lines to have a better sense of the overall size of these letters. And, and I would agree. I think less might be more in this case. Um, I could go either way. Um, I know that school's going to be starting, so they probably would like to, to get something up soon. But that said, I was thinking about what Mimi said about, you know, she doesn't want to second guess the designer, but I was thinking, you know, the previous signs that have been here all had like a white background, and perhaps that makes it more visible if you flip it. I don't know if they considered that, and I'm just... Um, so, and I think the other comment about what the materials are is, is a valid one. And an enormous comment as well. I, I have a question um, about the school year starting. Uh, what do they have to do to put a temporary sign up? So the code actually allows a temporary business identification sign to be approved by staff. 
but they're limited to eight square feet in size and um, they can only be two colors. So. One thought would be if you're com with your commission's uh, consent, would be to allow them to put up uh, a banner sign that's approximately the dimensions that they're proposing with the understanding it would only be in place for a limited period of time, provide them with an incentive to proceed with the permanent sign to completion, but also allow them some identification because this is starting in a new location and I think some kind of graphic identification on the street um, is important. Cindy, can I, can I, I agree with that? Something? Another? I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that I agree with that. I think that's a very good strategy to deal with the, you know, beginning of the school year while they maybe go back. Do they have time to go back and bring it back or no, so. they do not? not? Not before the school starts, right? No. No. Mm -mm. I mean, if, if there's a temporary sign. Yeah, the banners you can get done very quickly. So if there's a temporary sign and they, I'm just thinking about the permit application lifespan can they bring something back to oh us? The, the temporary signs can be up for 120 days okay so, so that would address yeah. the start of school year and then the permit application does not expire if we ask them to come back okay so we can continue this okay thank you um and if we if we are going to continue the item we should consider any, any future signs that might need a place on this or, uh, or on the, in the vicinity. So sign program or, or something else. Michelle, Mimi. Um, from my perspective, I also agree I'd like to see uh, another design come back. Uh, while I prefer to see something with the tree logo and that does have better visibility, um, and I tend to agree with the comments about the size of the words, Ross Valley, the font. Um, at the same time, I, you know, would leave that up to the uh, applicant ultimately, and I, you know, I am concerned as well about a future tenant that would need potentially shared space, and I would like the applicant to address that, either uh, with an understanding about uh, they'd have to apply for their own sign or uh, you know, whether there would be a way to accommodate the second uh, potential tenant on the sign, uh, you know, in addition to um, Ross Valley Charter. I also agree uh, with the comment about the materials and needing more detail about that. Um, And the scale model is also a good idea. Thanks. Scale as far as the size of the lettering, correct? Yeah, I think Norma had asked for a scaled model of the design and the sign. The actual, actual letters to scale. You didn't mean for them to bring in a, you just wanted an idea of the size of the lettering on that. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Michelle? So is the applicant willing to come back? And do you have an understanding of the comments? And the, so can I get clarity on the temporary? Can you come? Sharon Sager, could I get a little clarity on the temporary sign? Would, does that has to be two feet by four feet, or three, or under eight square feet? Or well, I guess what I'm saying is, with the commission's direction, I think we could probably specify a, a dimension tonight. Mm -hmm. If you wanted them to keep it smaller, mm -hmm. um, or we could simply mm -hmm. say, 
put a banner that fits on that existing sign and right, not that to could exceed give you, that. That could give you a chance to see what it would look like if we Look made it staff. to scale. No, that's the code that says that. But that's, understanding. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, with the commission's direction, we can do that because that's a staff decision on the eight square feet. Can you clarify that the requirements for the temporary signage is in the code, not discretionary? So under 1764.30, that, which is signs permitted without a sign permit, uh, under subsection B, uh, it says temporary non-commercial signs including but not limited to political or ideological signs, holiday displays, and announcements for non-commercial public activities or events. I don't know if school, I would think school would be non-commercial public activity. Uh, with the owner's permission in all zones and when not over 24 inches by 48 inches, uh, provided however that the sign shall be erected no sooner than 60 days before and be removed within seven days after the election or event, or if not concerning a particular event, for 67 days without a permit. Additionally, temporary non-commercial signs are allowed in the same locations in the same size and for the same duration that commercial signs are allowed without a permit. This is so. Permanent non-commercial signs and temporary non-commercial signs exceeding the size limitations set forth in 17064030 may be approved pursuant to 06470. In looking, in looking at the provisions, as Linda points out under 17064040A, temporary business identification signs. Is that what you're saying, Mimi? Since it's not really a business, it's a school, it would fall under the temporary non-commercial signs section? And we could uh, allow for one to exceed the size limit in that section under 070. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? Well. We, you know, we submitted one sign design because we thought it would be easier, but we actually have a couple of other designs that incorporate some of the things that you've been talking about. Do you want to take a look at them? I would probably have, have you come back with those now that you have the comments okay. from the commission. Okay. That would be easier. Temporary non-commercial, which this, is this non-commercial? The charter school? Could be the 24 square feet, the same size as what's there on a temporary basis as a banner. No? Or is it? Okay, is it so what I see, there's a couple different things going on here, Norma. One of them is that the, uh, there's a limit under the temporary non-commercial signs language, which we can allow to be exceeded under a different section of the code, but the limit is 24 inches by 48 inches. Okay, now under the section where we can Except there's also this thing that says temporary non-commercial signs are allowed in the same locations in the same size and for the same duration that commercial signs are allowed without a permit. And as um, Linda was pointing out, 064040 relates to commercial signs and it has specific language about temporary banners And it allows the temporary banner to be approved by staff. And that has a limit of 60 square feet with a width of three feet. 
and says we can approve even larger ones. Would a, um, and I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of the camp funder last sign that's underneath that seemed to be vinyl. Would it work to have a temporary, banner's not the right word, but to have a vinyl type sign there between those two poles? So it sort of fits under the banner piece, but it's not That's kind of small, a banner. I think. I think the banner's a little small. It's only about one foot deep by uh, seven feet long. Which banner? The banner you're talking about under the sign. The little, the... Yeah, I'm not talking about something that size, though. I'm talking about is there something like that material that could be put there temporarily I'm sure they could have a banner made up. That would fit yeah. between those two posts. Right, and be the same that size would fit as the proposed. As a temporary yes. banner right. until they come back and we could set a time frame that they would come yeah. back Lots with the options. Lots of businesses get similar things for grand opening signs and things, so. Yeah. I mean, that would work and then um, it sounds like you may even possibly be ready to come back at the next meeting that you could schedule them at, right? So if that works for you and then you can come back at the September meeting and bring the materials to staff and then we can look at those at the September meeting in the interim, you could put some type of banner between those two posts that would, that would work in the interim. Okay. So would we give them a time limit of like, you know, the 67 days is what the uh, code says for a temporary sign. And that's well beyond our September uh, meeting. So we could grant them that permission. I don't know if they need it, but just in case. And with a specific size area, that we're talking about, and I understand you're basically saying the same size that they're requesting for the application up to that size. Mm -hmm. Does that sound good? Through the chair, would we be then denying this application? We'd be continuing it so that there's no additional cost to right. the applicant. Right, you just continue it. So if I can clarify, so if we, if we are allowed to have a temporary banner up We'd be allowed to have a temporary banner up that is the same size as our proposed sign, or is there a specific size that we are allowed? Um, through the chair, I believe under 17064030B, no, is it B? Yes, B, that we could do that. We're fine with that. That would be a staff approval of that banner. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Okay. With, the, with the understanding that they'll be returning at the next meeting with an application for a permanent sign. So. All we'll right. Be, and we'll before be. somebody makes a motion to approve that, can I just ask, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, would you be opposed to the uh, continuance of this to bring it back with new designs? Can, can I just add one word uh, to the temporary? Can we say max at the end so that it gives them flexibility to go smaller if they need to? Because I know these things are very expensive. Um, and if it's only going to be used for a limited period of time. But the, yeah, and the assumption is it's going to go between those two Yeah, posts. so maximum so, size right. of X times that or Y, yeah. All right, thank you. All right, well then I'll move to continue this uh, item until our September meeting with the idea that uh, the applicant may uh, request approval from staff for the temporary banner as uh, previously discussed. Do we have a second? I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you.
Can we take a break, a short break? Sure. All right, five minute break.
Are we ready to reconvene? All right. Oh, yes, please. Let's go. All right, staff. Um, item three, discussion item. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Uh, what you have before you is a fairly modest uh, zoning amendment. Uh, the genesis of that was uh, the town council had discussed the fact when they were considering adding slope density requirements to the planned development zone, one of the questions was why the PDD district had not been subject to the hillside area uh, provisions. And we didn't really have a good answer for that other than as the regulations would have been applied up to the recent spate of state regulations, um, it would have captured much of what the HRD regulations require, um, but that with the loss of that flexibility um, and the need to have so-called objective standards in place up front when an application is taking place, um, it's probably a good idea, and of course that was uh, what we achieved with the slope density uh, amendment that we got through. So what we have here is a response that on one hand is very straightforward. It simply adds to the list of z residential zoning districts um, that are subject to the HRD regulations, and that's in the 17.072.020. And by the way, if you're having difficulty squinting at the version of the attachment that we provided with the staff report, we also have a full-scale uh, version of this on your, on your desk, so I think that's a lot easier to read. Um, I'll give the chair credit um, for asking the, uh, the question. Are there any other zoning districts, residential zoning districts, which are not currently applicable to the HRD? And sure enough, the Upland Residential um, did not have that inclusion. Um, and so in addition to the Planned Development District, or PDD, that you see listed in that 17072020 applicability, uh, we also included the Upland Residential. Um, the remainder of the language is fairly straightforward, um, and it's uh, basically to capture that the intent of the HRD requirements will be uh, included in the original application proposal. So it's, it's details to require that. And I'm just seeing. Yeah, and it's also to make sure that in our uh, Upland Residential that it includes that Cap it captures that requirement. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, and Linda, maybe you could reference the single family residential master plan. That was included in the original version, but it didn't have the right language that directs people to applying for the HRD. So this is at the very end of the 17116020 generally B. So it basically clarifies that this indeed also requires those submittal requirements. And uh, this has been reviewed by our town attorney and they're comfortable with the proposed language. So our recommendation is uh, to adopt the resolution recommending these amendment changes to your town council. Thank you. And I'm prepared to answer any questions. Commission have any questions for staff? I have a, a comment more than a question. Yeah, I, I need to clarify one sure. thing and it, this is a mistake. Sorry. Um, because at the time we were putting together this original, we had not had the feedback uh, from the attorney's office, so we said let's list this as a discussion item. So the recommendation tonight would not be to adopt the resolution, it's simply to discuss and provide direction to staff on the language. My, my apologies. Norma? Okay, that's clear, thank you. I'm very happy to see this come back, and I remember years past we've had issues and concerns about uh, adopting any standards for the PDDs. There was some concern that if you had a standard that it would somehow uh, be a, a project approval, which is obviously not the case. But now that the regulations have changed, disallowing 
uh, review by the town, which is something uh, our community is, is very interested in, having a say in anything that gets built, I think this addresses those concerns and provides standards and guidelines to protect our uh, preferred development uh, criteria and character in town. So I'm happy to see this. Did you have a question? No, just that comment. Other questions for staff? Michelle. So I'm with the Housing Accountability Act, I do see the need for standards, but I don't see the standards in this document. And so I think I'm, I'm feeling like I'm missing something. In other words, um, under page one, item A, it references standards. And then on page two of the staff report, it's referring to special studies, which could identify whether a site has some areas of concern and maybe has some recommendations. But then you look at attachment A, item A, and on, under item A, B, C, and D, these aren't called standards, they're called characteristics. Um, and the topic areas are referencing slope, landslide, but we're, but we're missing things like protected species, flood, fire, uh, and on this geology. So I guess my question is where's the standards or is this a process question or is this more about processing things in a certain way? I, I'm it, it is a process question. Um, it does point out that when we were originally looking at the PDD and saying how do we develop uh, objective standards, it was recognized that that process is a big process. Um, in point of fact, the town will be, and I mentioned this at, in my director's report at the last planning commission meeting, uh, we will be uh, making an application uh, through SB 20 grant funds to implement objective standards. Um, it, this won't just be uh, for the downtown area. Um, the intent is that this will also capture uh, looking at things like the uh, Hill Area uh, Residential Development Standards um, and the terminology. I mean, I think the characteristics, you know, when you have a slope, you could call that a characteristic, but the reality is, is that that tells you what triggers the provisions. So it's understandable as an objective trigger. Um, and the terminology that's present in the rest of 17064 is a lot better than what we have in the PDD chapter. So if we're really looking at how do we address future developments or proposed subdivisions? Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and this is just the first step. Um, and by, by basically saying, look, you're subject to the HRD if you have any of these uh, requirements. And the fact is, is that Lynn and I looked at some of the PDD areas that are even potentially developable. Um, and th it would be subject to the HRD. So that gets you into the HRD chapter which has a fair amount of, I believe, could be argued as objective standards and requirements for information from an applicant. And so what about the UP zoning? Did you find the same conclusion then? Yeah. Well, in, in the upland residential, there's two things, is that if you look at the size of the unbuilt upon parcels versus the zoning standards, that those are pretty close, so we don't have the same potential for subdivisions. Um, so we're really looking at, in all likelihood, design review applications for residences. So it's not as critical a need to lock all that down. But in, res in re response to your question, um, we do have that trigger that directs people over there. If you look at the, let's see, the Upland Residential Chapter 17024, the language under D, all structures, physical improvements, other modifications involving 
soil or drainage modifications that fall into the categories listed in 17072-020 are subject to HARD permit requirements. So again, it loops them into the H HRD requirements and those have, we believe, enough of the critical submittal requirements, information necessary uh, to, to do a reasonable job of evaluating applications. We can do better. Uh, we're in process of, of looking into that and hope by the time, for example, this next year that we'll, we have a lot better understanding of what that process entails and what the information is, but this is a good first step. Thank you. Laura? Hi. Um, can you please clarify um, what you mean by the overlay zone, HRD over? I mean, is it what, what makes it overlay? Is it the excavation only, or is it the slope of the property, or is it like a particular elevation that then all properties that are above a certain elevation are part of um, well, HRD? It could be any of those things, but what it really says is that it, the requirements of this chapter in this zone could apply to end any number of the other specifically designated zoning districts. So the fact is, is when you're looking at HRD, you're not looking at a, a physical location on a map. You're looking at characteristics of properties, residential properties all over the town. And so that's why it's considered an overlay zone because you have the, the underlying zoning and then you say, well, is this applicable? And so what we've done um, with pretty much all of the residential zoning districts as proposed right now is to say that if you have any of these characteristics, if you're uh, more than, well, zero to 5% slope excavating 200 cubic yards of, of material, you're subject to it. So in any of these zoning districts. Okay, so my, so like right now, like RS6, that's kind of like a standard zoning that we have. So um, normally you wouldn't go through HRD, but Unless, but isn't there a provision that if you exceed a certain amount of excavation, it triggers a grading permit? So I'm not quite sure what the difference is. When you get into our hillside areas, most of them are in landslide hazard zones. And so the HRD ordinance is meant to be, it's meant to provide information that's required at the building permit stage up front so that the applicants and the planning commission can use it to design the project. So. If you're in a landslide hazard zone, you have to give the soils, soils report information ahead of time so that the architect can design out of areas that are subject to sliding or they can repair the slides so that it doesn't damage some neighboring home. So there's a number of things that kick you into the HRD. If you're on a completely flat lot, you're not gonna be subject to the HRD. If you do a 50% remodel, you're probably gonna be subject to the use permit process. But if you're on a hillside and you have to excavate for parking, Right, you're go probably going to be in a landslide hazard zone, and you're going to be excavating in an amount that will make you subject to the HRD overlay requirements. It doesn't mean you can't build; it just means you have to provide um, soils and drainage information up front to the planning commission, and so your neighbors can review it, you know, before the house gets approved in the location it's proposed at, so that people can feel comfortable that the that the hazards have been addressed adequately through the design. Yeah, and I guess that, that was my other question when they talked about the minimum building site requirements. Yeah, how is that different than the, the use permit process? Yeah, so, so the way we've used this, although it may not be clearly laid out, if, if I get a parcel that's substandard in size and it's flat, it doesn't meet any of the other categories, so I'm not going to make them spend $10,000 for permit fees to go through the HRD process. I'm going to make the determination that it just requires a use permit. If it's a, if it's a, you know, a 10,000 square foot site on a slope that would require a 40,000 square foot size parcel and it's in the hillsides, I'm going to use that substandard size as one of the, you know, check marks to support why I'm requiring them to get the HRD permit, because they're in a landslide hazard zone, they're substandard in size. You know, they also include in here, I've never had to use it, the property's accessed via a private or public undeveloped roadway. 
Oh, I guess we did on a, on what's his name? <laughs> yeah. But the intent is, is if when you start to get in the hillside areas, there's all these, you know, this unstable soils, it's high fire danger. And so it doesn't mean they can't build, it just means they provide more detailed information up front prior to the public hearing. No, I have no issue like on the hillside. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to figure out what the difference was like on a standard like flat lot on a standard flat lot. If you were over on your excavation, that's because it seemed like that was one of the criteria. And I was just trying to find out what was the difference between calling it HRD or just requiring a grading permit or maybe they're like well, now kind of the same and then we're just there's an excavation the Can I uh, okay. interrupt here? So under 17072020, we got the applicability section, and it has four categories of properties that if they show any of the following characteristics from any of these zones, RS6, RS75, RD 5.5-7, RS RM or SFRMP, and the first category has to deal with the slope. So zero to 5%, your cap is 200 cubic yards. Uh, five to 15, 200 cubic yards. 15 to 30, 100 cubic yards. 31% slope, it must be, or greater, 50 cubic yards. Um, and then the other three categories are you've got a property within the landslide hazard zone and get this as shown on exhibit three open space element of the Fairfax general plan. I'd like to see the maps next time. Uh, and you know, I know when we did the general plan the last time around, we thought about updating the maps. So now that I see a cross reference to the maps, I'd like to make sure we got the right maps. Um, and then the second, I'm sorry, the third category is access to the property is via a private or public undeveloped roadway. An undeveloped roadway is an unpaved or paper road which must be improved. And the last one is the property does not meet the minimum building site requirements defined in chapter 1776 through 1788. And I wonder if that means like for some of the older parcels where you don't have minimum lot size and things like that. You know, it's not a matter of grading. It's just you don't have a minimum lot size there. Right. And then, and then what the different residential zones say is they say if you're substandard in size, you have to get either a use permit or an HRD D permit from the Planning Commission. That's where it gives staff a little bit of discretion. Right? If I have a flat lot that's not excavating anything, but it's substandard, I'm not going to make them spend $10,000 for HRD permits. I'm going to have them pay the 813 for the use permit. Right? But I'll give you another example is when you look at the, the relatively flat lot with the 200 cubic yards of excavation as being a potential trigger to be subject to the HRD provisions, that's 10 tandem trailer loads of excavation. So it's a pretty good incentive to a client, to an applicant to say, you know, you probably should think twice about doing that much grading on this relatively level site because you're going to have to sp pay an $8,000 fee. So, you know, applicants being pretty savvy to these things, they usually design less impactful projects to say, oh, we just have to do a use permit, for example. So as Linda pointed out, it affords some flexibility to say, yeah, you can go the hard yards, <laughs> Um, and do the full HRD, or we could, you know, reduce the amount of grading and process it as a use permit. Any other questions of staff before I ask mine? Uh, Go ahead. Nina. I had sort of a question, sort of a comment. Uh, to piggyback on, uh, on Michelle's comment about there are other environmental impacts which we ask for on a new de newly developed site, not just soils and hydrology, but also uh, and drainage, but also for habitat and uh, uh, endangered species and, and plants. So that's not stated here, but it is typically included in an HRD review. 
in an initial assessment that is typically required of a site. If they're, do if they're doing something like extending a roadway where they're going to be taking down a lot of trees, if they're just on an infill lot where they have houses on either side of them, we don't necessarily get into that. Okay, I'm going to ask a couple. Um, so the hill area overlay section states it applies to the um, SF RMP zone. It's just that the SF RMP zone doesn't have any language in it that then goes back to the HRD. What about the RMS zone? Which would be our, our yes. senior? Now, I mean, we only have one of those, but we're not yeah. addressing that, and we could theoretically have something somewhere else. So I think we would ask our attorneys to address that. I, I didn't okay. want to include that because that is so new, and it was drafted by the attorneys in a specific situation you okay. know, for specific okay. sized parcels. And so I have a feeling that there was a reason that it wasn't so that would be then one question I would ask staff to take back. Um, and then my other question is the language that you're changing or that you're adding to these other sections, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're adding a, like a section D, all structures, physical improvements, and modifications involving soil or drainage modifications. That fall into any of the categories listed in 170.72.020 are subject to the overlay. But when I look, because you're talking about structures, physical improvements, and modifications, but I guess my question on that was, um, and Mimi had said what those four sections were under 1707.2.020. It includes um, the slope. It includes, you know, if the property falls within a landslide hazard zone. Um, if there's access to the property via private road or it doesn't meet the minimum building standards. So I was questioning why we would just, um, what we're adding in here is just, to me, seems like it's only speaking about um, structures, physical improvements and modifications involving soil or drainage modifications. And the way I read that, and I could be wrong, it doesn't seem then to, in these sections that don't speak to the HRD overlay at all, it doesn't address the other, um, the other areas that could, <coughs> could make an application applicable like it's in a landslide zone, or it's going to have um, the property is via private or public roadway. And I was thinking that all of those should be included in these sections that don't address the HRD overlay at all, so it's consistent and it's not limiting to just excavation in that one section that we're adding, I was, if I understand. I guess I understand. we were trying to keep, I mean, you can, you can, we can list everything. We can list all, you know, A through whatever it is, A through D. But what I was trying to get at is that if you're excavating, you're, you're probably in a landslide hazard zone, you know what I mean? So we can list them all if that makes you feel better. There's not a problem with that. It just makes it kind of long. Yeah, that's okay. Well, we could, we could look at that. You're, what you're saying is you'd like to see in those specific chapters that the triggers reflect the full range of applicability, the f basically the four main categories you see in 1707.2020. So Correct, because that makes it consistent with, uh, I think, with the uh, chapters that already address the HRD. Um, and it leaves out a possible situation where you would have something in the landslide zone that may not. <laughs> by itself 
excavation. Have an excavation, but we should still be looking at the HRD if it if those applications fit one of those four. I don't want to limit it to just that one section with excavation if there's the potential that some of those other areas would fit and we'd have that benefit. I know, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem with working on it. My yeah. whole thing is if, if you're building anything, you're gonna be excavating in the hillsides. Yeah, that, so. <laughs> we concluded that it was more than likely gonna be a trigger anyway, but we'll, yeah, we'll look at you know, some way to just drop A through D, any of those characteristics, and then just say you're subject to yeah. that. I think, I think it, I'm sorry, I think it makes it clearer for the public or applicants as well. I'm also going to request, and I hope this isn't too difficult, I'm hoping not, uh, <laughs> that um, we get, in addition to you giving me some information about that open space map from the general plan that's cross-referenced in uh, O. 170 uh, because we are looking at uh, adding this language for um, chapter 1712, 112, I'm sorry, chapter 17, 116, and chapter 17, 124. I would like a map that highlights where those zones are for our next meeting so I can see them in relation to the town. And to the extent that, uh, where's the one where it matters if it's over five uh, acres? It's like. The SM. Isn't that the SMFP or whatever it is? The single family. Yeah. It's the single family residential master plan district, right? Yeah. Anyway, if there's some relevance in terms of the difference in the way the zones work based on the acreage, for some reason I have this idea that for parcels over five acres, there's some different rules in one of those. Well, yeah, the, the five acre is basically a trigger for something being subject to the PDD regulations. Um, it does get a little bit tricky because when you think of five acres, there's only a very few residential zoning districts where that's even a possibility. Those, that's what I want to know. Yeah. I, wanna, I want you to show me visually where those are. And perhaps on that, because I think when we went over the PDD once before, I think there was some flex, and I could be wrong because I haven't looked at it in its entirety recently, but I thought there was flexibility so that the five acres wasn't a hard and fast, but I could be wrong on that, so if you could check on that as well. Yeah, we know it's not a hard and fast rule because in the housing element where they were discussing housing receiver sites, at that time they were talking about rezoning certain sites in the town to PDD with the intention being it allows you the maximum flexibility in terms of density and design. <coughs> but the challenge is many of the sites that they're evaluating, for example, the um, China Villa uh, property is well under five acres. So where the general plan leads, the zoning follows. So even though the zoning may say it's a five acre trigger, um, the general plan says, uh, you know, look into applying it to that site. Any other comments for staff? Yes, I, I have one, please. Um, I'm looking at, what am I looking at? Attachment A, second page, the redlined section F. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that the HRD permit application comes to the Planning Commission, process concurrently with plan development application and any associated applications. Uh, could you give us a, a cheat sheet on what those requirements are for, what the submittal requirements are for each of those applications to 
get a really good sense of what's required where and um, what may or may not be missing? Yeah, we're talking about application requirements. Just for the HRD or for the HRD, the PDD, and the... Okay. So, for instance, there were issues before about do we require that they submit a financial pro forma for a project or different levels of submittals that could be very relevant to a particular development, particularly in a PDD or HRD zone? Yeah, okay. some of that, we'll, we'll come back with submittal requirements, yeah, what's, but some of that, again, owing to the work in progress nature of future amendments to the PDD zone, that's the only tricky part is right now as constituted, you know, I mean, just play the old violin. Um, it, it worked very well to address the actual specifics of parcels that are zone PDD where you have constraints and you want to really suss that out before you even really get into, okay, how many units and where exactly? You have to do the constraints map. But state saying it's one size fits all, get all the info up front. So some of that, if you look at the PDD submittal requirements, it's not necessarily as clear. The beauty is with the HRD, we do have that ability to say, we're going to get all this information mapped out with your submittal. So we'll, we'll come back with some submittal uh, information. Thank you. Anything else for staff on this, Michelle? So I guess I just wanted to say just to my fellow planning commissioners that we took a lot of time to develop a work plan and that's supposed to be our focus and I don't like being pulled away from the work plan and especially when um, this is not comprehensive. I understand why we're doing it. I really want to see the HR, the HRD standards really fleshed out. I'm, I'm in support of this because I can see what we need to do, but I'm frustrated how we can get distracted and not do the in-depth work that this community needs and I'm hoping that we get that grant and that's it. Also could we review again our work program? I think we looked at it a few months back but there's been a lot of water through that bridge. Okay, anything well, else? I well I will allude to some components of that in my director's comments. Anything else on this item? Any other comments for staff to take back? If not, Let's go on to, you've got everything you need, right? Let's go on to item four, minutes of the July 18th meeting. Any corrections from? I was absent. I was also. It says any corrections or comments? Am I right? Okay, I have a couple. Wipe that smile off your face, Ben. Um, I don't think there were any public comments at that meeting. I think on which item? On, oh, uh, open time, non-agenda items. I think. Yes, we believe Mr. Hamer did make that remark. Then go, please go back and double check whether it was made at the June meeting. Okay. Or the July meeting, because I think those that's the same um, huh. public comment that I saw on the June, and it may have just been carried over. I don't think we had any public comments um, on that one. So, and if we didn't, you can delete that. And then 
Page two, first paragraph under number three, just a typo. At the end it should read um, where it says on page five, I think, I think it should read on page five and it says on page four. Got it. And that's all I had. Um, I'm looking at the June 20th minutes and uh, Chair Swift is so good. It's identical. Yeah. I don't know if Taking Mr. Hamer is repeating himself. But no. I. We'll check. Well, you see our minutes clerk is very good. And, and of course, but forgive us for human. not focusing on open time public comments. She, she is terrific. Uh, I have to say she works very hard at it. Yeah, with that uh, change then I'll move to approve the um, minutes from the July 18th meeting. Second. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Abstain. Abstain. All right. Thank you. Now we have the planning director's report, please. Yes. Uh, we are moving along with the consultant selection process of the EIR for Marinda Heights um, and we'll be scheduling, once a consultant is selected, we will be scheduling a scoping session um, with your planning commission in, in the context of your planning commission. Um, so that proves to be, uh, promises to be a lively evening um, and I would recommend if you have not done so already to begin the process of familiarizing yourself uh, with all things Marinda Heights. Um, I did walk the site with uh, uh, Chair Swift and uh, she was really good about getting to the top of the site. I, I have to say I was. I shocked you, didn't I? No, I was uh, just, just impressed because it was one of those lovely warm days too. So in any event, um, and that offer stands, of course, not in a group context, but any other commissioners who would like to get a familiarization hike. I, I would love to do that sometime okay. when it's cool. Thank you. <laughs> as soon as the weather breaks. Um, we could probably arrange for something like that. Start at the top and hike down. Just bring a walking stick because it's a little bit slippery. Um, the other thing that the time limits ordinance that your commission reviewed a couple months ago, the town council did look at a first draft of that. They had uh, some suggestion um, regarding treating the initial timeline as being the effective date of the adoption of the ordinance. So. In other words, even though we have an incomplete application that's nine years old, we would treat that as being newly uh, subject to the time provisions as of the effective date of adoption of the ordinance, so October 2nd, which is fine. It just gives people another 180 days to talk to us and say we have a, uh, we, we need a further extension, you know, another 10 years, no, I'm just kidding, um, to, uh, Sub complete our submittal requirements. So it'll give us a little bit more time to get ready to begin the uh, expiration process with those uh, applications that have been incomplete. And other than that, I don't have much to report unless you have questions. Uh, I co I'm, I'm sorry, when are you saying we would have that scoping session approximately on Miranda? Well, it's a good question. Likely, it'll be in the later fall, is, is as near as I could tell. That's something we would have to sit down with the consultant and probably the chair, the planning commission chair, and, and look at holiday schedules and thing like, things like that, recognizing that you know, the holidays, as strange as it may seem, are not that far away. So um, just to comment, since you brought up the other zoning changes that went to the council. Um, 
I know one of the areas they discussed was the time frames. You know, the 180 days or, you know, both for regular um, applications and also um, for when we're coming back in an enforcement um, situation. And I know at our first meeting um, on the topic, where we had um, our architects on the commission, I think we had a discussion um, and they were concerned about the initial draft and, and the time frames that were in there. And I think based on those comments, um, it came back to us with longer time frames. And I think the council had asked um, staff to go out and kind of research those more, talk to the building, exchange. builders exchange, things like that. Um, and just my only comment on that is um, I don't think there's an expectation that for things that come from <laughs> us to the council, such as that, that council members may necessarily spend the time to watch the two meetings or any number of meetings that that item, those items were discussed at um, the planning commission um, and nothing was, was spoken of in the staff report at that meeting to go into some of the discussion points and some of the changes that occurred here at the planning commission. So if they were aware that um, there was discussion um, on lengthening those time frames here from professionals on the commission, then that may have been good information for them. And I don't recall seeing that as, as a part of that, that back and forth. So just a thought that when we take things to them, you know, where if there's salient points that come up, at the commission that get worked and maybe because of the discussion here there's some changes made before it finally comes back to us and then goes to the council would, would be helpful for them and perhaps for staff then maybe not having to do that follow on work. Just a thought. Yeah, it's, it's a point well taken. Um, certainly it was staff's intent to uh, discuss the fact that we did stretch some of the timelines uh, in recognition of the comments and the commission in particular, uh, the architects who noted that some of the technical studies. So I think I mentioned that one of the challenges in the staff presentation was it was after 10 o'clock at night. And it was one of those things where, you, you know, I almost see somebody doing this signal the whole time you're making your presentation. And certainly I didn't complete my proposed verbal presentation. Uh, but as you note, uh, that's another one of the items that the council has requested is to look at those timelines and say, oh, gee, for the, uh, for example, enforcement, you know, they, they understood and supported the fact that you don't want to give enforcement cases the same, you know, 180 days and another 180 days type of thing, um, but that you have to be realistic about um, the same type of constraints that they may be presented with in getting technical information together. So we're looking at that um, and doing the outreach to the various to, uh, selected architects and, and boards. And I don't think we've gotten any comments back at this time. So we're working on it. I might, just on uh, Cindy's point, I often find it a lot easier to digest the discussions at the planning commission level when I'm just reading the minutes. And so to Cindy's point, even if they aren't approved, they could be an attachment if they're, you know, particular to the issue that's coming before the council. Because I know those council members, even if they don't get a chance to listen to us opine for a couple hours, they actually read their packets. So maybe including some pertinent uh, planning commission minutes in general on things that are going up to uh, the council, you know, might be helpful. Yeah, this, the, the July to August uh, rollover was particularly challenging um, because we had back-to-back -back planning commission and town council meetings and then uh, a short 
time frame to the next town council meeting with, oh, I should have said something about cannabis. I, my, my, have it, I think it's just battle fatigue, but that was 22 public hearings and they voted uh, first reading on the ordinances. So that will be coming back to your commission. Um, we're working with the attorneys to set up a process, flesh out the process for that with the anticipation as stipulated in the regulations that um, there will now be uh, an application period um, after which there'll be concurrent review if there are multiple applications. Uh, it was specified that there will be one additional site, uh, a business location, which could be either delivery only or uh, medical dispensary or a combination. Um, so, and insofar as there has been ongoing interest in this in Fairfax, uh, well, at a minimum, you're going to see an app, one application, and we wouldn't be surprised if there are multiple. So that's probably another set of regs that, you know, once the council um, takes uh, action on the second reading and it gives all indications that that's likely to happen, um, that's going to be town code within 30 days. So as soon as that 30-day period uh, occurs in October, uh, we'll be setting up a process for the applications that will be coming in. And we're looking at how we deal with our submittal requirements, et cetera, right now. Go ahead. So I would like uh, next month, if it's okay with everybody, to get a little briefing on the language that they're approving, because they will have approved it by then and the role of the planning commissioner with respect to the ordinance that they hopefully pass. If not next month, then certainly the month after. Um, and since we've kind of rolled into the commissioner comments and requests, um, going back on the minutes, They're not post. None of them for this year are posted. I went back to you know to look some of them up. So if we can. And I don't know what happened because I did send them to Camille. Okay. And then nothing happened. And in the meantime, she taught us how to load things ourselves on the website. But um, Kara and I haven't had a chance to do it. It's yeah. just been busy. We got. We have a lot of citizens out there that are very needy. <laughs> okay. Any other? Um, Comments and requests uh, from the commission. I, I have a comment in December. Don't we take December off? Like too close to okay, the 25th. Because and, or if you're not all available, then we have to I'm, cancel it or reschedule it. I will tell you now, I am planning to be out of town <clears throat> like mid-December on. So... So you won't uh, be available. I can't make a planning commission meeting in December. And can you just um, give the actual dates to, to staff so they know, just in case we're looking at things like the workshop for the EIR? That would be helpful. I'll, I'll know when I know the exact dates. OK. Yeah, something that else that falls into it, just by the way, the December date is the week before the uh, Christmas holiday week. And in November, it's two weeks before Thanksgiving. So November doesn't appear to be as problematic in terms of proximity to the main vacation periods. But as Cindy requested, that's always helpful to us because things start to get a little hectic around the holidays. And it, we would also look at the how many projects we're processing and other time sensitive items that we believe require commission review. Another request, um, as Commissioner Rodriguez pointed out earlier, we spent some time last year going through priorities and I'm kind of disappointed that we've gotten to this point of the evening so early and uh, maybe breaking before we have a chance to spend like three hours deliberating on one of those issues that was our priorities. Cindy, how could you let this happen? 
it can't. won't happen next month. For That's sure. what I'm hoping. I, you know, maybe we could publish the list of priorities with one of our packets just to remind ourselves what those were, because we we actually can't. I don't think it's wise to just toss them away because we're too busy. Well, uh, we're certainly not too busy, but as you know, one of the top three was Miranda Heights in, insofar as that's moving into an active phase and will be, if we can spend 22 meetings on cannabis, we can do a lot of meetings on Miranda Heights. So, and that's going to be a tremendous amount of data, a tremendous amount of public involvement. So I think in terms of where our priorities are, that's numero uno. So would it be possible to include in our packets just kind of the end product of what we worked on? So we have, because we did a lot of work, we had a lot of documentation somewhere in there, and I've got it at home, but somewhere in there there should be like a, a listing um, that identified what we came up with for priorities, and that may work. That may work just to refresh our memories of what we did almost two years ago. Also, if we could get any information from Cassidy about any work that she may have done or any assistance that she may need. Um. Yeah, as I reported uh, at the last meeting, our expectation is that when we're doing the objective development standards, um, that will have a historical component. So uh, to the extent that Cassidy is or isn't able to actively participate in that, um, that would be part of that. But that again gets back to main work program priorities and the time frame and the bandwidth and your commission's uh, involvement, et cetera. Michelle? I just wanted to go back to your comment on, and a com I have a question, and a question. Um, on Miranda Heights, when you said familiarize yourself, uh, are you asking us to go to the website then and familiarize ourselves with the documents there, or what, 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 what do you want us to be doing? I would, I would certainly recommend, yes, you start with the documents on the website. Um, if you want to get paper versions uh, to take out to the site, for example, you know, some of the site diagrams, um, I'm happy to provide those, uh, but it's a it's 100 acres, and um, you know, with 10 discrete proposed building locations, and uh, as Chair Swift can attest, it takes you a couple hours minimum to walk up there and really visit each building location. So there's a tremendous amount of material there. I don't know how deep a dive you need to go into the applicant's technical submittal. Uh, items at this time. Um, I believe that as we get into the EIR process and the merits review, we will, of course, be looking very closely at that. Um, I would say it depends on a, on a time and interest. Certainly, the items that we know are going to be very important, such as the geological investigations and conclusions uh, and the vesting tentative map information, for example, the proposed grading at the very top of Marinda Drive extension, I mean, getting right up to the ridge line at Oak Springs. Um, that's going to be, you know, in addition to the building sites, just sort of conceptually starting to understand what's proposed there uh, is, I think, would be very helpful to start to grasp that. Also, even though I haven't been involved in no way with building site 10, um, it's well worth going around to uh, the Live Oak side and um, finding a place to park and hiking out to that proposed building site, you know, which is basically straight above St. Rita's School property, um, things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's time to kind of get an understanding of where the building sites are at a minimum and to the extent you have the time and interest to look at some of the technical information provided by the applicant. Those basic maps on the town's website, the maps in the area and the sites, and we can all get of all the, the current budget. information. And let me know if it seems confusing because we've tried to organize it in terms of current submittals so that you get an idea of what's the background information. Um, we've 
pretty much posted everything simply because there's been requests to do so. I think it's still at the library now. Is the information still at the library? Um, but I, I'm sorry that I uh, missed the invite for this last tour. Uh, so was the uh, applicant there at the site? or do we, So should we arrange a planning commission tour, or are we all individually going well, we'll to do that? Well, we'll do that. Or? We'll certainly do that prior to any meeting. Um, but I'm, I'm just saying if you want to do one-on-one -on -one, um, and, you know, with questions, and I can uh, just provide you with information about here's building site two. You know, building site one, for example, is a little bit unusual because it's shifted. Where's building site two? Um, because it's shifted to next to building site six. So it's not intuitive when you look at the plans. Um, the applicants did that simply because it would have cost them thousands of dollars to renumber every site. So mm -hmm. he just picked up the lowest site, um, which didn't work because they didn't have enough room for that parcel and shift it to a different location on the property. And so did the city council make any decision about anything on that site before us? They were recently considering something and did they make a decision on anything about that? Um, I would recommend that you look at the council minutes. Um, and that's that posted regard. up there? The that? count, that's a good question. Uh, no, that was a separate council item because that's, that was dealing with acquisition discussions. Okay, thank yeah. you. I think that was during closed session and it was reported back after a closed session. Um, <clears throat> and access is not an issue because most of this is all public trails where the public usually walks or is that, I mean, I think what um, Commissioner Rodriguez's question that is in my mind is if I walk on there and walk around to these various locations, it's not gonna be, I know for example, that the open space, when I was on the open space committee, we had uh, used the trail that goes all the way up. Uh, there's also another publicly accessed trail from Upper Ridgeway that goes through the eucalyptus and up that way. So my question is, do we have full access uh, and does the public or is it just because we're commissioners? Well, as a... Uh pending application, um, and as commissioners, um, you have the right to access property, you know, any residential property, of course, if it's occupied, you would uh, talk to the applicants, et cetera. In this case, because uh, the applicant has said, yes, anybody can use the property, um, can access the property, so that's not a problem on either side. Um, as noted, the extension of Marinda Drive, which goes up to o the, the fire roads running off of Oak Springs on the ultimate ridge line, uh, the skyline ridge line, that's, that's one side of the site where nine of the proposed building locations would be. And then on the Live Oak side um, is, is parcel 10. Um, and that again is the, probably the trickiest part about that is finding a place to park at the end of the pavement. Um, I'll let you figure that out, but that's easily accessible as well and fully publicly accessible. Um, I'll just, as a familiarization item, when you get, when you walk around on the fire road on the Live Oak side and go left to the applicant's building site, if you go right, pretty soon on that trail, you're off the applicant's property. There's a trail that runs along the spine of the ridge, um, and that's a, some type of right of way there, and the applicant's property is actually off the ridge. So those are some of the more nuanced details, and it's probably not necessary to get into tonight, but um, it does certainly, you can walk up either one of those finger ridges, get to Oak Springs, walk across on the pavement, and then go down the other side. It takes about an hour. Um, and it's a, great, it's a great workout, and it's a great way to familiarize yourself with the site. Bring shoes with great traction and probably a hiking stick, because there's sections on both sides that are really slippery. Any other commissioner comments, requests? Seeing none, do I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you.